Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read verses 1, 2, and 3. And this is our 19th sermon in the book of Ephesians since May. We got away from it last two weeks with uh, the Lord's Supper and uh, baptism. But notice as we come here to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to title the message this morning, Characteristics of Sinners. And with most of the sermons that we have preached in the book of Ephesians has been centered around the saints. Now tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, saints as we close out Second Timothy. But we've mostly been talking about the saints. We preached one message uh, titled, uh, Shall Not Inherit the Kingdom. And we did deal with darkness to light, uh, but that was mostly dealing with the saints. And we also dealt with the old man and new man. But again, we mostly dealt with the saints of God. But notice here as we come to verses 1, 2, and 3, and again, characteristics of sinners. He said in verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of, and of, the, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for, again, another week you've given us. And it's already been stated, a beautiful day. We thank you for the privilege that we have again to assemble together. Lord, we ask that as we come here, you would receive our worship as we sing together and pray together. And Lord, and uh, we just pray for thy blessings to be upon us, for thy presence to be with us. Lord, we pray for help as we come to uh, this book again. We just pray for thy guidance and thy leading. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible makes a clear distinction between the saints and the sinners. Two different paths, two different uh, directions, and two different lifestyles. And I think as we study verses like this, we're going to look at here this morning, I think as we look at this, we can understand both ourselves and also others. We can understand who we are as children of God, but we also can understand others and their uh, position as being lost. Now, what is interesting, as we come here, I'm, I'm going to take verse 1, 2, and 3, and we're also later going to turn to chapter 4, verses 17, 18, and 19. And then we're going to go back to a passage we preached in weeks ago in chapter 5, but especially verses 3 uh, through verse uh, 13, and at least read through these passages again. We've turned to this in our series, uh, it's turned into a series uh, since uh, back in the summer, and we've read from these verses several times, but I just want to camp out here uh, for a little bit. Now, when we see the word sinner or sinners, this word is used over a hundred times in the Bible. We also find that the word saints, the saint or saints, this word is used about 100 times in the Bible. It's used in the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament. When we talk about sinners, we're talking about the lost. And when we talk about saints, we're always talking about the saved. As a matter of fact, the word saint or saints is mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 1 of this book. In chapter 2 and in verse 19... It's mentioned uh, again in uh, chapter 5 and in verse 3. And, no, and I believe it's mentioned in chapter 4 as well. Now, when we talk about sinners, we know uh, we're talking about the lost. We talk about the saints, we're talking about the saved. Matter of fact, one of the clearest passages on this word saint is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, when Paul writes the letters to those who are sanctified, those are saved, and they're referred to as saints. When we talk about saints, it refers to the status of believers. And the word saint means holy ones, chosen ones, belonging to God, sanctified, separated unto God, and separated from the world. 
Saints and sinners are contrasted throughout the Bible, whether it be the Old or the New Testament. Now notice here in their passage again, this speaks of the spiritual nature of unbelievers. He said here in verse 1 again, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, had, we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I've used this passage many times in witnessing to people, not only Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and other places, but I've used this. And this is a graphic picture of the entire human race. No one is exempt from the verses that we're reading here this morning. Now, someone can be lost, and they could still be a good neighbor. Uh, they could be a good citizen. Uh, they could be an honest person. And still yet, even though they would have those uh, qualities, they're still lost until they're converted or they're born again. And that's sort of what we want to talk about this morning. It's more than just what we do, it's what we are. Amen. We find here in this text that we're born this way. We're born into sin. Now notice as we come back again in verse 1, he says here in verse 1, and I just want to pick out some words in, in these passages and, and point them out. But he said in verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He begins here with this little conjunction, this little word, and, and we find that this is showing us a continuation from the subject of chapter 1. If we back up just for a few verses in chapter 1, we're going to find he's been talking about Christ, he's been talking about the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the same power that quickens you and I by which we're born again. Notice chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. He says, And what is exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? He said in verse 20, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So again, when we come down to verse 1 of chapter 2, and... Again, this is connecting the passage together. And again, he's been talking about the latter part of chapter 1, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's that same spirit, the same power that, is, that, that makes us alive. He said in verse 1 again of chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The word quickened here is used um, again in verse 5. He said, even when we were dead in sins, even, let me back up, even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved. This word quickened means to be made alive. It is the imparting of eternal life. It's the giving of life to our dead spirit. The Lord Jesus said in and John chapter 6 and verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So we know that in John 3, we're born of the spirit. To be born again means that we're to be born of God or born of the spirit. So to be quickened means to be made alive, spiritually speaking. He said in verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You'll notice that this word dead here, and trespasses and sin speaks of spiritual death. As we're going to read a little bit later in chapter 4, verses 17, 18, and 19, we were alienated from the life of God. It speaks of the unregenerate, the lost sinner, and we would see this many times throughout the Scripture. But notice as we come to verse 2, he said, "...we're in in time past, that is, before that we were converted." before that we were saved by the grace of God. He said, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We find here that before we were saved, and, and again, I want you to think about this. 
When a lot of times when we uh, talk about sin, a lot of times it's things like drinking, gambling, and fornicating and things. This is going far beyond that. This is talking about who that we were by nature and by birth before that we were saved. In other words, he says in verse 2 again, wherein in time past you walked. We see this a lot throughout the Scriptures. We see it in chapter 4 and verse 17 in this same book. We also see it in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and also in verse 8. There are those that walked in darkness that now walk in light. So when he used the word walk or walked, he's showing the activities of the individual, the conduct, the behavior of life. In other words, walking the walking dead, spiritual zombies. I guess we could say it that way. In other words, before we were quickened by the Spirit of God, spiritually speaking, we were dead to the things of God. It doesn't mean we couldn't read the Bible. It doesn't mean we couldn't even quote the Bible, but still yet we're spiritually dead and as in Titus Three verses three through five tells us the, uh, about regeneration and, and the new birth, and so that's what he's talking about here. But notice he said in verse two again, "Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world." Now we've, and this year we've come across passages in Timothy and our Sunday night studies, our Proverbs studies on Wednesday night, where well, we've uh, looked at the uh, meaning of the word war world in the Scripture. And it's the world system, basically, he's talking about here, headed up by Satan. And it has to do with the world's beliefs, the world's, the world's values and morals. It has to do with the world's ideologies. It has to do with the world's philosophies, even the attitudes that are in the world, uh, the world's entertainment, the world's goals. In other words, the spirit of this age. It's much more than drinking and gambling and fornication and things of that nature. Much more than that. It has to do with the world's philosophies and the world's entertainments, all of this. Well, we all walked according to this. I was with a family here not long ago, probably three, two or three months ago, and they were doing some projects um, to the property and things like that. And, and they said, well, we only have one life to live. We might as well just, you know, en enjoy everything and have what we want to have. And I'm thinking, no, there's another life. When this one is finished, this one is preparing for the other one. And uh, we're preparing in this life. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy life, but we're preparing now for an eternity. And, uh, and that was worldly people. I, I'm not saying they're wicked people, but they were not saved making those comments to me. In other words, we're going to get everything out of this life that we can, is what, what they were saying, because there's nothing after this. So I had the opportunity to uh, open the door and, and to witness during this time. Now notice he said in verse 2 again, we're in in time past. Again, that's before our conversion. He said, you walked according to the course of this world. Each one of us. You say, I've never been a drunk. You still walk according to the course of this world. You walk according to their values and their morals and their philosophy and things of that nature. You say, well, I've never taken drugs. You still were walking. We all were walking according to the course of this world. And when he talks about here the spirit that now worketh, in the children of disobedience. Notice verse 2 again, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, in other words, all lost people are led by Satan in one degree or another, and they don't even realize that. Now notice as we come to verse 3. Again, I, we've read these two or three times since summer, but I just want to come back and spend one message on this. And then the next message I'll be preaching from the book of Ephesians will be out of chapter 5 and verse 20 when we celebrate Thanksgiving on November the 3rd. Uh, I'll be preaching from that text if you want to be looking at it ahead of time. Now notice as we come to verse 3. In verse 3. He said, among whom also we had our conversation in time past, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. 
When he uses the word conversation here, he can have, yes, it can have to do with our speech, but it has much more uh, meaning than that. It has to do with our manner of life. It has to do with our walk. And you can write down Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Uh, the Apostle Paul told the church there, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, he said, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 talks about changing our vile body in resurrection. So we find here, as we come back to this, he said in verse 3, Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, notice, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. He mentions our desires, seeking self-gratification and self-preservation. In other words, people and animals share the same basic drive when it comes to that. Many people live like an animal. Uh, they just live for uh, something to eat. They live for them, their own selves and survival and things of that nature and never be thinking about eternity and thinking about the Creator. He mentions the flesh and the mind, two sides of the old nature. Uh, the flesh has to do with the outward, the lust of after physical things, and the mind inward, dealing with pride and selfishness or self-will and things of that nature. He says here in verse 3 again, he said, Among whom also we, uh, we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, that is, by birth, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now again, there's many other passages that deal with this. Psalms 51, Romans 5, beginning in verse 12 to the end of the chapter, deals with our Adamic nature. It deals with the fact that we were born in sin. But I think this is important when you're witnessing to someone because people can easily get to comparing themselves with somebody else and they're not quite as bad as somebody else. I have this to happen often as I witness to people. And the problem is not exactly what we are doing or what we have done. The problem is who that we are by nature. So in the latter part of this passage, he said, and we're by nature, again, that's by birth, we are born this way. And this is why we have to be quickened, made alive, regenerated. He said, who were by nature, notice the children of wrath, even as others. So by nature, by nature. I'm not going to turn to these passages, but in Romans 3, not asking you to turn, in Romans 3 and verse 23, most of you can quote this passage and, and especially the surrounding text you probably are familiar with. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Think about that. And in the context here, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's in the context, uh, beginning in verse 9, says proving both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And then in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's describing our condition that we were born into. Romans 5, I just mentioned that. Romans 5, beginning in verse 12 down through 20, verse 21, uh, we see that it covers uh, the, the entire human history from Adam to Christ. I'll read one verse out of chapter 5. It said in verse 19, For by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We have a connection with Adam, and that's why we have this sin nature, and that's why this by, again, by birth, we are the children of wrath. Write down two other passages. We may read one of those a little bit later. In Romans 7, verses 12 through 25, Paul clearly describes the sin nature that even still exists in the believer, that is, in our flesh dwelleth no good thing, and then in Romans 8, verses 18 through 24, the whole creation is affected. You see, we groan within ourselves, even as Christians, waiting for the adoption to wit, that is the redemption of our body, but the whole creation has been affected by this sin. But notice 
the last phrase in chapter 3. And again, we spent an adequate amount of time on that probably a month ago when we talked about the subject. There are those who shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But he says here, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. If you're taking notes, chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, we'll read that toward the end of the message. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and one other passage, John 3 and verse 36. The wrath of God abideth upon those have, who have not believed and who have not received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, notice with me as we come to chapter 4. In chapter 4, I want to take three more verses. And again, we've read these at least two or three times in the last few months, but I want to just make a few comments on them. If you ever want to just do a long study on it, just run references on each of these words that are in these passages we're going to read, and it clearly shows us the sin nature that dwells in every individual. Well, notice now as we come to chapter 4, in chapter 4, and I want to read verse 17, 18, and 19. And what we're going to have in this passage is another list of words. There's six things that describe the condition of the lost. He said here, beginning verse 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. We find here again the condition of every lost sinner, and we were all in this condition at one time before conversion. Now again, there's a lot of synonyms, a lot of words that's given to us here to describe our condition before salvation. The first thing that he mentions, verse 17, is the vanity of their mind. Verse 17, there, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. Notice he's saying that we're not to walk as those that are lost. We have a different walk. As we looked at three weeks ago, we're the children of light. We've been delivered from darkness into light, and we're to walk as children of light. There's a difference in our Christian life. So he mentions here in verse 17 that they walk in the vanity of their mind. That means they walk in their emptiness of mind as far as God is concerned. The word vanity means emptiness, fruitless, false, void of value. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 14 verse 15, the word Vanities is used for idols or idolatry. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul speaking about the gospel and, uh, and how that the Corinthians were saved. As a matter of fact, he says, uh, I gave you verses 1 through 4, but in first two verses, he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That is, believed to no avail. In other words, it's not genuine. And that's what he's saying. That's the ideal of the word vanity. There are those who uh, have believed in vain. It wasn't genuine. It wasn't real. And, uh, and you, you, you can ask many people, get on the street and talk to them, and there'll be many will tell you, yes, they believe. And, and so, but they have, many of them have believed in vain. One writer said, lost men dream up many religious concepts about God and how to get to heaven. And they do. They have their mindset, they've created their own God and how that they would get to heaven. And so we find that the lost basically walk in the vanity of their mind, the emptiness, uh, the void that is there. They have no understanding and concept of the true God of the Bible. Notice something else 
here in this passage. Notice in verse 18. Again, this would be a good study. Uh, I've done this before. We've taught on this in a, in a verse-by-verse setting many years ago, but it, it's, it's worthy of studying. Notice something else about the lost. He says here in verse 18, having their understanding darkened. Now, again, we preached on light and darkness just a matter of weeks ago. Their understanding is darkened, speaks of the depravity of their heart and their mind. Again, I'm going to give you some verses. Chapter 5 and verse 8. Again, I've already mentioned that. Chapter 6 and verse 12, describing this darkness. Colossians 1 and verse 13, we have been delivered from darkness unto uh, the kingdom of Christ, been translated into His kingdom. In Acts 26, 18, we're actually going to close in that text and read that a little bit later, but it speaks of this. Paul, the apostle, is very clear about being delivered from darkness into light. That's the ideal of the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4 and 5, begin there those that walk in darkness and those that walk in light. Romans 1, verse 21 and 28, they chose not to retain God in their knowledge. They were not thankful. When they knew of God, they were not thankful. They went about their own ways. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 speaks of the natural man that has not the understanding of the Spirit and of the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So they're walking in spiritual darkness. But notice something else in verse uh, 18. He says here in verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. They're alienated from the life of God. Write down John 17 and verse 3. They're without spiritual life. And uh, they're without spiritual life that comes from knowing God, as I just mentioned in John 17 and verse 3. They're void of the new birth. They do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in them, as in Romans 8 and verse 11. They're not born of the Spirit of God. And that's what he's getting across here in this passage. But notice also that we find in verse 18, the latter part of that, he said, because of the blindness of their heart. Blindness. That is hardness of heart. Calloused. That which is cold. As Pharaoh hardened his heart toward God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's the way it is with men today. They don't want to retain the knowledge of God in their mind. God will turn one over to a reprobate mind if they continue in the rebellion and in their hardness. Jesus spoke of this in Mark 3 and in verse 5, and also Matthew 13 and verse 15. He spoke of the hardness of hearts and those who were blind in their hearts and could not see spiritual things. Now notice with me in verse 19. In verse 19, he's continuing to describe the loss. Then as we get into the rest of the chapter that we spoke about maybe six weeks or two months ago, we spoke about the old man and the new man. But notice verse 19, he continues here. And he said this in verse 19, "...who being past feeling..." have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So we find here in this passage that the, they've given themselves over to, the, the, well, let me put it like this, who being past feeling have given themselves over. In other words, past feeling. Their conscience is seared. They are unmoved even by hearing about the judgment of God. And, and so again, the, uh, for, uh, 1 Timothy 4.2, if you're taking notes, and Romans 1.32, seared conscience. And even those that are involved in the things of the world, they're numb to the things of God, and they even take pleasure 
in these sins knowing it's against God and that they one day will be judged because of the sins. They even take pleasure in other people sinning with them. So this is the condition of many in the world today. And he goes on to say, giving themselves over, voluntarily yielding themselves to this rebellion against God. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. This verse is used several, this word is used several times in the Bible. It's used um, in Galatians 5 and verse 19. It's a work of the flesh. It's used in 1 Peter 4 and verse 3. And obviously, we read this weeks ago in our Proverbs series. It's used in Jude, verses 1 through 4. Lasciviousness means a license to sin, a looseness, excess, lacking in moral discipline. In other words, it has the ideal of turning the grace of God into that which it is not. And it has, it has the ideal of those who will justify their sin. I've, I've, I've sat and listened to people talk about grace and save the grace of God, and then turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, twisting the grace of God so it can fit their lifestyle. And that's the ideal that we see here with this. And uh, Titus 2, verses 11 to 14, we read about two weeks ago, we find that uh, the grace that saves us will also sanctify us. Same grace that saves us will sanctify us. And God has saved us and set us free from sin, not that we can flounder in sin, but that we can serve Him, Galatians 5, verses 13. He mentions uncleanness here, uh, that is to live the way that people want to live, and he mentions the um, in, in uh, verse 19, uh, greediness, greediness, that is a covetous man, is never satisfied. The men of this world, the women of this world are never satisfied they do not have that void within them filled with the peace of God. So they do not understand this. Now let's read just a few verses. Let's go to verse 22. Again, preached on this weeks ago. Old man, new man. But I want to just read a few verses. And again, we are not to walk as we walked before we got saved. We are not to walk as the lost walk. We're not to be chastened all of the things of this world. Now again, we, there's a lot of things that we can enjoy that are godly. But then we're not to be chasing, chasing the things of this world. You remember probably two months ago, we preached a message on sports and the Olympics. We started off in Luke chapter 16, where it said, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Think about the things that the world is just crazy about in our country. Just think about the different things that, they're, that they seek after. Well, if something is highly esteemed among men, we need to think about it. We need to really think about it. If it's highly esteemed among men, God says that it is abomination in, in His sight. Before I read in verse 22, it's going to be talking about the two natures. One, as a Christian, we're to put off. A lost man cannot put that off. We're to put it off. And we're to put on and walk in the new nature. But I gave you this quote about four years ago, dealing with the two natures within the believer. And it's, the quote is actually titled, Two Natures Beat Within My Breast. And it goes like this. Two natures beat within my breast, the one is foul, the one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. Notice in verse 22 through verse 24, he said that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We find this principle uh, again from verses 22 through 32. We find it again in Colossians chapter 3. 
a few different words that are used, but it's speaking of the same thing. When you glance down through the latter part of chapter 4, you're going to find they were to put away lying in verse 25. The reason for we members, we're members of one another. Put away anger in verse 26. Neither give place unto the devil in verse 27. And it deals with stealing in verse 28. Verse 29, it deals with our communication. Let no corrupt communication perceive out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. In other words, we are to deal with our tongue and our conversation as a Christian now. We're never, never to speak things that will not edify, only that which will build up another person, never criticize or tear down. He said in verse 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Spirit. Many Christians never think about that. They never think about certain things, certain attitudes and actions and words can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He said in verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then in verse 32, he said, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. Now, we all got enough to work on there for the next 15 years, and uh, so we could stop now and go home, right? But we're not. <laughs> we're not through with this yet. But think about this. The old man, when we think about the old man and the new man, as saints of God, we're going to see this as we get back in chapter 5 in just a moment. But as we consider this as saints, we're to put off the way we used to think, the way we used to talk, and the way we used to live. We're to put that off. If we fail in that anywhere, we confess it and get it right. Confess it and forsake it. And so we're to put off the deeds of the old man and walk in newness of life. Again, Colossians 3 speaks of, uh, I believe it's verse 5 through 7, speaks of mortifying the, the flesh. And in Romans 8, 13, the only way we can do that is by the Spirit of God. You can say, I'm going to quit saying this or quit doing this or quit going here. You can say that all you want. Willpower power will only go so far. We need the Spirit of God to deal with the flesh and, and in our Christian life. Now notice now, as we come to chapter 5. In chapter 5, let's come and read the first four verses first of all. Chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Now again, we've preached two messages from this chapter. One is verse 5 and 6, those that shall not inherit the kingdom. And then from verse 8, uh, from darkness to light or something of that. Now notice in verse 1, he said, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, that is, not fitting or proper, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now again, we spent an adequate amount of time in, in these verses. We find here that the saints, beginning in verse 1 through 4, they are to walk in love as dear children. We're to walk in holiness and righteousness before God. Verses 3 through 13, there's a contrast between the sins of society and holy living. There's a contrast. Verse 3 tells us, said, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And then talks about, again, our speech, our words, the things that we speak forth. 
we find here very, very clearly that there's some things that we are never to be participating in once that we become a Christian. Now notice in verse 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6, I'm going to read these, make a few comments. We're going to read from verses 7 down through about verse 17 or 18. And now I'll be turning to one of the passage and we'll be closing. Notice in verses 5 and 6, here's a warning, a sober declaration of judgment upon the lost, upon those, those who have not been converted. He said in verse 5 and 6, This know also that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now think about these passages. Again, we preach an entire sermon on these two verses. We find that in verse 5, there are those who are going to be excluded from the kingdom. Those who have not been born again and living the lifestyle of the world. We also find in verse 6, the latter part of verse 6, that these things, because of these things, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We find there are those in verse 5 excluded from the kingdom of God. And in verse 6, they are subject to the wrath of God. This proves that not everyone will go to heaven. And... Uh, the Apostle Paul basically says, and I won't quote this verbatim, but in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, 10, 11, he says in that passage, be not deceived. I'm not quoting it verbatim, but he's telling the church, be not deceived. He said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let us not be deceived in thinking that people can live a life of sin and then enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, they, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so let us not be deceived in that with our loved ones, our family, our neighbor, or anyone else. Let us not be deceived in these things. Now notice now as we come to verses 7, and we'll just read several verses here. And this is a contrast, again, between saints and sinners. Now, can a saint fall? Can a saint make mistakes? Can a saint sin? Yeah. Back in 2010, one Sunday morning, I preached a message just titled Saints. We came back that Sunday night and titled the message um, The Sins of Saints or something like that. In other words, it shows that we as Christians, we can fall into things. We can make mistakes, but we can't live in those things. God will not allow us if we're truly born again. Now notice as I read the contrast, and again we preached from this just weeks ago, the children of God and the children of the devil. He said in verse 7, he said, Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye, some t for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is something we see over and over. If we're Christians, then we're to walk as Christians. He said in verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We find in, in, this, in this passage here that we're... Uh, verse 7, we're not to participate in the sins of the world. Verse 8, contrast our past with our present, darkness to light. Verse 9, those who walk in light manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 10, those who walk in light are pleasing to God. Notice coming back, verse 9. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Verse 11, I mentioned to you weeks ago when we was in this, 
our lives, our Christian lives, without even, without even words, our Christian li- life will reprove others. Now, we can, we got to be careful how we do this and do it in the right way. But yes, we can reprove with our words. But our life, if we're living a godly life, it will reprove and rebuke a sinful world. And I gave you the passage in Hebrews 11, verse 7. Not only was Noah a preacher of righteousness, but Noah proved his faith in his works and building the ark for the salvation, the physical saving of his family uh, at that time. The Bible says that Noah condemned the world. In other words, he kept laboring for the Lord when the world was going their way. And every, I don't know whether they had nails or pegs or what, but every nail or whatever it was that went into that ark said, every one that went in, every time he hammered on that, said to the world, judgment is coming. And so he condemned the world in in the sense that he was a preacher of righteousness and his fruit, his works, his good works proved that they were wrong. And that finally came to pass in the flood, just like it will come to pass at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now notice with me in verse 13. In verse 13, I'm just going to stop here because in two weeks from today, we're going to come back and take up verse 20. And we have already preached one message, fullness of the Spirit. We want to come back and use this verse to deal with thanksgiving. Well, notice in verse 13, he said, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doeth make manifest is light. Now I want us to turn, and I want us to close in the book of Acts in chapter 26. In the book of Acts in chapter 26. I'm going to read about three verses from this chapter dealing with the subject of repentance and again darkness and light. A couple of quotes about repentance. John Bunyan has said, Wilt thou leave thy sins and go to heaven or will thou have thy sins and go to hell? John Milton said, Repentance is the golden key that opens the palace of eternity. Charles Spurgeon said, Repentance is a change of mind, but what a change it is. We find the word repentance used over a hundred times in the Bible. Used a lot by the Apostle Paul. Used by the Lord Jesus Christ. We find repentance in Acts 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21 in the context of conversion. The Bible uses uh, the phrase repentance unto life in Acts chapter 11, verse 18. In Acts 17, verse 29 through 31, God has commanded that all should repent and receive Christ as their Savior. You'll notice as we come here, I want to begin reading in verse 18. In verse uh, 18, he says here in this passage, and this is Paul speaking of his salvation speaking of his ministry that God had given to him. And he says in verse 18, 19, and 20, this is what the Apostle Paul was preaching, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ Jesus. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Two weeks ago, this Sunday, we were reading a passage on baptism. And we find that John the Baptist in Matthew 3 and verse 8 says, bring forth therefore fruits for repentance. In other words, he was telling them to show that they're genuine and to prove that they have been truly 
say before that he would baptize them. He demanded evidence of their salvation before he would baptize them. Repentance is more than a decision. It is really a way of life. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, they turned to God to serve the living and true God. Luke 13.3, Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So we find that repentance is a doctrine of the Bible and is forgotten many times. I know of preachers, not friends of mine. I wouldn't stay friends probably with somebody. I know preachers that that will preach against repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. There's many that preach against that. And we find that in Acts 20, 21, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be. Amen. Again, as I mentioned, Acts 3, 19, 20, and 21, there's repentance and then there's conversion that is mentioned there. So as we come to this last passage... Repentance is like an about face, a permanent change of direction. In other words, we're willing to confess our sins before God, put our faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, a new path that we'll be walking on. And that's not teaching work for salvation. We made that clear recently too in Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. I just wanted to come back and do this. Uh, I want to just show not only will the lost not inherit the kingdom, will, uh, they are subject to the wrath of God, but I want to make clear that they're lost, not just because of what they do, they're lost because of the condition they were born in. We are all in that same condition. Well, notice here again, and we're going to, we're going to close here in this passage. The Apostle Paul, again, standing for King Agrippa and others. And by the way, if you, if you uh, take a look at verse 27, 28, and 29 later, we find that Agrippa said he almost became a Christian. Thou almost persuadeth me to be a Christian. We don't see any sign that he did. It's not good enough to almost get somewhere. It's not good enough. We got to, we got to make it there. And we see no repentance in his life. King Agrippa knew the Old Testament Scripture. He knew what Paul was preaching, that the Messiah was to come. But I close with this just to say those that we know, whether it be family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, whatever, they have to come to the place to be born again. They have to come to the place of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And that will be the change that will take place in their life when they surrender to that, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They surrender to that and put their faith in Christ. The Lord gives us His Spirit to help us to walk in newness of life. We can't do that on our own. It's the Spirit of God and His Word. It's His presence and His help uh, in our lives. So let us not forget these things as we witness and try to minister to others. Let me read this one more time and we'll close. He said in verse 18, Paul saying, This is what I came to do, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith in, that is in, in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we thank you this morning for this, again, this opportunity to come together. We ask your blessings now upon the singing and the closing of the service. We ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.